Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ash Jogalakar. I am a science writer and a scientist. Um, among other things, I write for the website Three Quarks Daily. And today I'm extremely pleased uh, to welcome George Dyson, uh, noted historian of technology, historian of science, uh, explorer of artificial intelligence. Uh, George has written a, a variety of fascinating books, uh, ranging from uh, talking about a, a native kayak named the Baidarka, uh, to a nuclear-powered spaceship uh, called Orion, and um, uh, also great books about the early history of, of modern computing, as well as uh, you know whole, whole smattering of very interesting thoughts on artificial intelligence and technology and its history. So I'm uh, very pleased to welcome him. Uh, so welcome, George. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here uh, remotely and, and yep. have a chance to talk. We would have if things had been different, we, we September we would have been at uh, Freeman Dyson's memorial. That's right. Yeah, at, at the Institute for Advanced Study was scheduled for right about now. So. Yeah, no, I, I I was certainly keeping track of when that that's going to happen, but hopefully we can have a much bigger uh, celebration uh, as, as as at the earliest. So, so yes. look forward to that. Uh, so George has just come out with a, a really great book. It's called Analogia. So here it is. And the uh, subtitle is uh, The Emergence of Technology Beyond Programmable Control. So, uh, you know, fascinating title, uh, lots of ramifications. And um, it's in part um, uh, an exploration of various technological themes uh, throughout history. Uh, but it's also a very deep personal exploration. And, and I think that's what makes the book uh, very unique and absolutely worth reading. Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, George, what was the inspiration for the title and, and how did you come about uh, writing it? Well, the, the title, it's an interesting question. The title was, was simply a placeholder. The, the oh. title, it's the only book, uh, I believe titles are supremely important. It's the only book where I did not come up with the title and, and fight for it against publishers who try and change it. And of course, I always hate subtitles, but that's the, the publisher actually controls the subtitle. But that, that title was just simply a placeholder. The book, you know, I read, my last book was Turing's Cathedral, which I spent, I spent more than 10 years writing that book. And the last thing I wanted to really do was write another book, but it came out and it did, did very well. And so Eric Chinsky, who's a great editor at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. That's sort of the, the happiest place a, a nonfiction or even a fiction writer could could be. He he approached my agent right mm -hmm. after, right when Turing's he was saying, oh, I, I, I want George's next book. And, and I, I ha had been incubating this idea for a book for a long time. Um, that, it was completely different. What's interesting is that the, the book I saw very clearly had a beginning chapter and an ending chapter mm -hmm. and they don't exist in the, in the analogia that you have. The oh, first see. chapter and the last chapter are not there. You, you're kind of left with what was in the middle. And, and in the original book I wanted to write, it was actually fiction. I'd never mm -hmm. written fiction. So I said, you know, I, I, I always, I don't want to get stuck doing the same thing. I didn't want to spend my whole life being the guy who lived in a tree or, you know, so now I, I didn't want to be the, the guy who just wrote these historical accounts. So the, the, I had this very clear book set where it opened and closed in the Aleutian Islands. I'm, I'm passionate about the Aleutian Islands. It's sort of, if you imagine an intelligent designer who wants to design the perfect kayak, mm -hmm. the way they would do it would be to design a planet like Earth that has this thousand, one and a half thousand mile string of islands that are about a hundred miles apart at the same latitude in a stormy northern ocean. And that would be like the, you know, God's laboratory to design the perfect kayak. Mm. And so this book opens in the Aleutian Islands before the Russians get there mm -hmm. in terms of what we would call prehistoric society. But, but so there's, no science, but there's very high technology. The Aleuts had a very sophisticated technological and cultural system. So, so I wanted to capture that. And the only way to do it would be fiction, sort of mm. make up this world that was like, like these worlds that you see in films, Avatar or something, but it's mm. actually on planet Earth. And then the Russians show up. 
and, and then all this other stuff happens, the, the whole development of technology. And then the ending chapter was also fiction set in the illusions, but it's in the world after now where the entire world has been digitized and, and taken over. But the powers that be who are somewhat sensible realize that they, they need a sort of biodiversity reserve for human beings. Mm -hmm. And they choose the illusion. So the illusions is the last place where, where you can live without any sort of like Erewhon, the, the fictional butler novel. You, you can do whatever you want, but you can't have uh, this modern digital technology. So, the, so it's back to the world as it was at the beginning. And all they know of the outside world is occasionally, you know, drones come through and take pictures and stuff. But otherwise, they, they live the same life they, they lived for 10,000 years. It was just this interlude of... Of. But anyway, so the book ended up, those two chapters are gone, and the uh, the middle is kind of what you got. Oh, okay. And the, so, so <laughs> the publisher went to my agent and said, you know, we want George's next book, uh, but, you know, we got to have a two-page proposal. And, and so John Brockman, my agent, he just, so, you know, we got to have a title. I mean, you can't just say, you know, George's next book, so... Uh, but I knew I knew it would be a lot about analog computing. So it was sort of so analogia to me was this place. It was this this sort of imaginary world where where the digital hadn't penetrated. Yeah, that that is fascinating. And of course, you know, analogia I, for some reason it reminded me pretty much right away of Stan Ulam's quote about yes. the good mathematicians seeing anal an analogies between theories and the great ones seeing analogies between analogies. Yes, and it, it looks like there's this this deep undercurrent of analogy uh, behind the very diverse stories that that you tell in this book as well. Yes, every story is a is the analogy for something else. That's obviously I mean, being a Ulam disciple, right. you would get that point. And, yeah, yeah, and and so it's interesting you mentioned this, you know, very interesting idea of a world where people have high technology, but it's it's not digital. And, and, you know, it almost seems like they're, they're doing more sustainable living that way, uh, just like the Aleuts did, you know, back then. Um, and, and this actually leads me to a question which I was going to ask later, but I think it's very pertinent right now, which is, um, are you worried that we are forgetting a lot of this technology uh, that, you know, people in the past invented? Um, you know, is it, is it being preserved well? Is it being recorded? Uh, because, you know, it's very easy for us to think that we may not need that technology. But, you know, everything from being able to build a, a, a Bidarka, you, you might be the last living person who maybe knows how to do it. I don't know. But everything from that to navigating by the stars, which, you know, the Polynesians did so well. Uh, is, is that something that, that you worry about? Yes, I worry about that a lot. That's sort of what I devoted much of my life to. Right. I think we're, we're lucky in that the there still are, there are these little groups of oddball individuals who preserve things. There's somebody, I was made an honorary member of the Adelatl Society, which is the, a society of people who are preserving the art of, of the throwing stick. And they're, they oh. hunt, hunt wild boars with Adelatls and, are, and have reconstructed all the techniques. So, so there are people preserving. Of course, we have museums and anthropologists. And, uh, and now we have such great of course, technology for capturing artifacts and things. So I think I think we're okay there, but it's certainly something to worry about. And you have to worry about losing the the really hidden knowledge. Mm. Um, you know, like I mean, the, the people who made these long kayak voyages. I mean, kayak voyages they'd be out away from land for forty eight hours and and so on. And, and the question people always ask is so that when you ask when you really talk to an astronaut after a cocktail party or something like, well how did you uh, you know how did you go to the bathroom how do you urinate and, and how do you it's urinate in a kayak and and I actually talked to somebody who talked to somebody who knew and told me but that's a, you know that sort of that's still non-documented knowledge that, right. that you know, I'll tell somebody and they'll know but it's not as far as I know, not written down. If it was written down, I think I would know. Yeah. And and that kind of knowledge you capture best by actually living the, you know, recreate the the life that you're interested in, which is how the best 
you know, the people who Jane Goodall became Jane Goodall because she went just said, I'm going to go live with the, mm -hmm. with these animals. And, and then the great anthropologists became knowledgeable by going to live with the people they studied. Right. And, and what's interesting, of course, is that, you know, this is certainly true of what we think of as old or older technology. But even with new technology, people sometimes worry about this in the context of nuclear power. And, yes. you know, just, just the other day, I was rereading Asimo's uh, foundation and, you know, how, how there's this group of people on a remote planet who have kept the knowledge of nuclear power alive. And that kind of helps them, you know, stay isolated and still thrive, uh, you know, in the sea of, uh, you know, hostile, uh, you know, belligerence, basically. And, uh, you know, people have said that since nuclear power is no longer in vogue, it's, <clears throat> you know, all these reactor designers who, who know all the tricks of the trade, you know, they are not, they are sort of passing away and there's no new generation to replace them. Yes, you know, it's very much the same with nuclear weapons. We haven't built any for a long, so long that the actual sort of Ted Taylor kind of skills of, of how do you actually build these things is, is evaporating. Los Alamos, fortunately, they had a very active program to preserve sort of oral history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a pretty good debriefing after the last, after the Saturn V moon rockets and stuff. So, but a lot of that knowledge is, is buried so it becomes, it becomes inaccessible again. Right. Every, everybody right. thinks it's saved, but then, oh gosh, where did we put that? We thought you had the last copy. No, we thought you did. Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, the you know, as I'm I'm a chemist, and and uh, for me, the 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 value of this was driven home a couple of years back when this Chinese woman, uh, um, uh, Tu Yu, she got the Nobel Prize uh, for and first, you know, purely indigenous Chinese person to get a Nobel Prize in science who worked in China. And her specialty was um, ancient Chinese medicine. And she actually discovered this an anti-malarial drug called uh, Ar artemisinin. And it turns out, if you actually look at what she did, she dug up this 2000 year old Chinese manuscript about preparing drugs. And it turned out that the, the key step really, which allowed her to isolate this from uh, you know, the plant that, that it, it was in, was just steeping the plant at a particular temperature and then lowering the temperature in, in certain increments. And you know, this is a pretty obscure detail. It's, it's not something that you discover without a lot of trial and, and error and experimentation, right? So I think that's partly what we seem to be referring to when we talk about these you know, quirks of, of the trade. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so you know, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the, the meat of the book. You know, a lot of it is about analog computing. So you know, just for, for enlightening people who are not too familiar with it. Uh, you know, could you talk a bit about the distinction uh, between analog and digital computing? Also because, as you know, there's cases where it's not that clear. Something that seems to be analog might be digital and, and vice versa. Yes, there's a very fuzzy distinction between the two. The technical distinction, in my view, it's not the medium you can have uh, digital computers made out of wood and you can have analog computers made out of silicon it's, so it's not you can't say well it depends what it's made out of it's uh, you know in, in again in the ulam sense it's the analog computers are computing with continuous functions and digital computers are computing with discrete uh, functions but uh, sort of history is a good example sort of after world war ii we had all this analog electronic equipment left over from the war radar mm -hmm. s screens and uh, vacuum tubes and so on mm -hmm. and then this group of oddballs which was sort of the turing's cathedral story is how mm -hmm. how people uh, built digital computers out of that analog equipment and you know, computing these strictly logical functions where each uh, each bit, each one or zero has an exact meaning. And if you change that bit, you, you change the computation. Right. Whereas uh, analog computation is much more sort of resistant to, to uh, it treats errors in a different way. So the whole secret of, of doing so the whole problem with making effective digital computers was error correction. How do you hmm. correct these analog errors that creep in? And that was the, what preoccupied von Neumann's group three quarters of the time was just spent uh, correcting errors in vacuum tubes. And 
then what I believe is happening now is that we now we're in an opposite situation. We have we have this enormous glut of digital equipment. We have like digital equipment. I mean, we're just wasting billions of digital cycles per second. You know, we're talking about science, but many people are just talking about their dogs and cats. And, uh, so the meaning isn't particularly important. It's just just all this all these digital bits. And what what's happening is that you can you can build analog computers out of these digital parts where you start treating the stream of bits the same way a vacuum tube treats a stream of electrons. You treat it as a, you don't care about the individual electrons, you just care about the statistics, the frequency, the pulse frequency, the relative. And you care about the architecture, the meaning is in the topology of the network rather than the exact uh, function of any particular digital code. And that that is just as important as as the other side. So if, when, if you look at nature, which is, uh, you know, I look at all technology from the, through the lens of nature, nature uses digital computing in a very precise, strict way in, in our genetic systems. We, like nature invented digital computing for, for error correction, because it's very good at, you know, our biology depends on these exact sequences of nucleotides and not only do the errors have to be corrected, but occasionally you want to introduce a, a favorable error, an error that, that leads to evolution. And, and digital is the way you keep track precisely of these errors. And, but nature doesn't use digital computing for, for its intelligence in any other way. I mean, all nervous systems of a fly or a mouse or a cat or a dog or a human those all those nervous systems are analog systems they work they don't compute in a series of strict logical steps they can sort of compute everything at once in a network and it's a very clear distinction and people like von neumann and stan ulam and alan turing who were, were all very explicit i mean they fully understood that's how the brain works mm. and that digital computing is something different they're not trying to trying to recreate the brain in a digital way they're they're doing something entirely new and different. And I spent much of my life looking at the development of the digital side. Right. It's, it's sort of obvious I would spend, you know, spend some time, hey, what about the other side? So right. now I'm... And, and so it looks, it looks like there's, there's huge opportunities for incorporating this thinking about analog computing in you know, our efforts towards modeling intelligence and understanding AI and so on, but, but it still seems like for the last 20 or 30 years at least, uh, you know, almost all of AI has really relied on digital computing and people aren't thinking about analog as much. And, and you know, uh, well, first of all, I, I wonder if you, if you think the, the same way, whether the field has been sort of dominated uh, a little too much by digital computing. And secondly, I wonder if it has something to do with the economics of it which is that you know building all these neural networks is a is a billion dollar business now and so the maybe the incentives for thinking more about analog are not quite aligned yes and it became so cheap to do it with i mean when when von neumann and turing were working they it looked to them like i mean this digital stuff would be so expensive of course you'd have to do things in an analog way you couldn't afford you know the trillions of transistors and so on and of course now transistors are effectively free so we still tend to do it with transistors we have in fact most people working on neural networks are actually just simulating them on strictly digital machines mm -hmm. there's only there's sort of a, a very fringe movement to actually build circuits in silicon that are analog circuits that are not just digital models of, of analog circuits right and that you know that i think where the future is going to come from is the sort of top down and bottom up that there will be uh, there's this phenomenon of, of if you look at these large successful systems Amazon or Facebook the ones that get hauled into Congress for being too big they're you know they're enormous analog networks that's their strength and their power is the, 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 the analog power of that network um, but then on the bottom sort of the, the way things always in nature come bottom up and top down on the bottom up you're you're, you have these small groups who are building actual analog uh, circuitry using the you know microfabrication techniques we developed for digital, and those are, are I predict. I mean, if you're going to put your money somewhere, that's going to we're sort of at the stage of the first four-bit 
you know microprocessors you could barely play a game on in that world but they're they're, they're be driven by cell phones drones self-driving cars things like that because because the power consumption is just you know it's orders of magnitude lower if you solve a problem in a in a directly analog way right and then of course there's all these processes um you know there was a, a paper a couple of days back a couple of years back which actually showed that there are certain numbers that actually just cannot be computed uh, using digital uh, computing, but can be computed using analog. So it seems like there's something very fundamental about the, uh, the kind of analog processing that even the brain does that we must understand if we are truly to you know, try to replicate its functions. Yes, I mean, that's of course, Freeman who's sort of our common friend and you know he's my father and your friend and he he was a strong believer in that and, mm -hmm. and loved that paper and and if you look at his you know Freeman's paper on how that how life and mind could continue in the universe for eternity it's it's an analog system it, it works by analog coding not just because digital coding you can which is what Szilard proved at the beginning it has this energy cost that that uh, is, is going to kill you but uh, but in, in an analog way, you can avoid that. And I think nature realized that long ago. Right. So that's, that's a great opportunity to, to talk about Leo Szilard, obviously one of the most fascinating characters uh, in, in the recent history of science. Um, I have actually been in, in, uh, in touch with uh, Bill Lanouet. Uh, yeah, his biographer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's a friend. And you know, he was telling me about uh, a little bit about how Szilard interacted with the biologists at, at the Salk Institute. In, in San Diego, and and I believe you have some stories about uh, uh, meeting his wife, and uh, when when uh, when your father was spending uh, uh, some time there building Orion, um, and and can you could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, that's a sort of that's an important thread through this story. I, so is it there's these characters in this book who are women? So there's Helen Dukas, who is Einstein's Mm -hmm. literary executor sort of his his partner professional partner and 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 trudy Szilard, leo Szilard's wife and and among others including my mother but they these women were all partners to these great scientists and they i don't know if they felt sorry for me or whatever but they but they played an enormous role in my life they sort of took me under their wing and and, and both of them very clearly set my path you know, towards building boats and being interested in killer whales and so on, because uh, they sort of explained to me that very clearly, like, look, you know, Freeman's your dad, but you don't need to be a scientist. You'll be happier if you're not a scientist, and that's a perfectly good thing to do with your life. And right. and, and and Helen gave me Contiki, which was the first grown-up book I read that set me just from the moment I read Contiki, I wanted to build boats. And Trudy Szilard gave me the book she had, she had actually edited and written it. That Leo had dictated it. The voice of the dolphins, where these intelligent dolphins save the humans from themselves. And that book again just made me, you know, where are the dolphins? I want to go find them. And of course, I found killer whales, not not dolphins, which are the largest dolphins. But so Trudy was an amazing character. She smoked a pipe occasionally, and just was a a rebel. And 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 I showed up. I was 11 right after Leo died. And some for some reason she used to take me out of school. She'd just march into school and sign a slip and take me out of school. I was at this, this awful sex, seventh grade bored to death. <laughs> and she just would sign me, I don't know, you know, she said, oh, George has a doctor's appointment or something, but she would get me out of school and, and take me to lunch at, the, at La Valencia, this fabulous hotel on the La Jolla waterfront where, where she and Leo had lived. And she would have a, I think now I realize it was probably a pink martini. She had some kind of drink. And we would just talk at lunch. And that, that was a hugely, you know, formative part of my mm. childhood without those, the help of those people who, who, you know, who straightened me out as to sort of how the world really works. So I, I owe her so much. And I, I was so happy when I found that the photograph that's in the book is mm. done for life. It's a, portrait of her that's right that's just, yeah no that's a great story and you know another remarkable woman who you don't mention as much in this book but you do in curing's cathedral 
is Clara von Neumann. Yes, who and, I didn't uh, know personally. But. Who you didn't know personally. Well, I, I must have met her, but she didn't, oh, didn't have any impact. No. Right, right. But, but, you know, people forget that she was one of the first computer programmers and, you know, totally overshadowed by, by Johnny von Neumann. Um, but, you know, so speaking of Zillard again, the, the voice of the dolphins. Now, that's a fascinating story about this group of dolphins who is trying to keep humanity uh, from, from destroying itself. And then, you know, you pursue this very interesting thread about intelligence in, in killer whales. And um, nobody really still understands how, how they communicate with each other. But it seems to be a form of distributed intelligence in some sense, right? Um, and that, uh, you know, we, we have talked about this a bit before, but that just opens up so many fascinating avenues of thinking about analog computing. Because distributed intelligence, which is found in a, a select few members of the animal and plant kingdom, you know, octopuses and fungi and trees in general. Uh, it, it looks like there's just so much that we can learn from it. And it, it also looks like the, the best that we have been able to do to try to replicate that is the internet. But that still leaves a lot wanting. Yes, but the internet, we're still at the very beginning of the internet. It's sort of right. day, day one of the internet. But no, I mean, I have very strong opinions about whale communication. Because when I, you know, just a few years after I met Trudy, I ended up as a, 17 years old in British Columbia, going off to, to work on a boat that was, we went to this orca lab run by Paul Spong, who, who was beginning to study communication among killer whales. And that was 50 years ago, it was 50 years ago this summer. And everybody believed that, you know, Paul was putting down hydrophones and mm -hmm. taping all the communication that, oh, in, you know, in a few years, we're going to uh, decipher the language. Like just give us enough computing power, enough recordings, you know, in no time we're going to figure out the language. And, and 50 years later, an enormous computing power, nobody has a clue about language. I mean, we've identified sort of dialects of sound, but but nothing about language. And I, and I personally believe that, that no language is there. That we're, we're not going to find language because it, why, why use a language? We need a language because we are speaking in a noisy environment uh, mm. through the air. And so we have to invent these symbols that describe things we commonly understand and we exchange the symbols. So we have a symbolic language and, and right. human intelligence. But, but if you have a creature with, a, you know, killer whales have brains that are four times the size of human brains and just, and four times as complicated, mm. um, who are in a medium where they, they see the world through sound Mm -hmm. And they communicate. It's as if we could, if we could communicate with light, if I could directly uh, project an image into your brain, we we wouldn't. I wouldn't have to have a word for cat. I would just. We would just exchange the image of a cat or something. So, so you wouldn't have. You don't know, necessarily. So language. If there was a language, it would be completely different. And, you know, there's the odd sort of Hollywood movie that there was this. Arrival tried to get a sense of that. What if you, have, you know, completely different, but still everybody goes back to, well, it's, there's got to be a language because we think, you know, children aren't intelligent until they speak language. And so nothing can be intelligent without language. But you could have, you could easily have a completely functional uh, distributed intelligence with, without language, the same way that, that in the brain itself, you know, von Neumann went looking for the language of the brain and you said, there is no language, it's just statistical properties you don't need language yeah the, the, what you said about the cat image reminds me of Wittgenstein's quote whereof you cannot speak thereof you must be silent so the whole picture theory of language that he came up with where you just communicate through images but the moment you start describing them it sort of all goes away that's that's what it reminded me of um, yeah so it, it certainly seems like we we have a lot to to learn um, and, and we have sort of been obsessed with language as the one thing that makes humans special. And, and it looks like that has led us astray to, to some extent, obviously. Yeah, and, and all the more true with, with searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, again, we've done it all by trying to, you know, listening for language. Right, right, yeah. Just, just which, which again, Freeman totally had right. He said, don't, don't look for intelligence. You have all kinds of intelligence would leave absolutely no trace. You, what you're looking for is big technology because that will be detectable. 
Right. And and that's actually that's something that that you said I believe it it was in one of the the edge.org conversations where you said that you don't really think the Turing test is the best determinant of intelligence because you know you're trying to find out intelligence that would announce itself but if it's true intelligence it probably would not or it was something along those lines right yes yeah i think that, that people have the turing test completely backwards it, to, to me according to the conventional turing, which of course is named after turing but yeah, he would i think himself dismiss it i mean the idea that that you can detect intelligence in a machine by having a human conversation with it mm -hmm. And I think it's the opposite, that the test of a, a truly intelligent machine would be, be intelligent enough to not reveal itself. Right. And, so and the, a, the absence of visible intelligence is no proof of the absence of AI. And, and that's why you look for big technology uh, like that represented by Dyson Spheres, for instance. Yes, well, at least because they're detectable, not because they're necessarily likely. Right. But it's the argument, you know, why do you look for your lost keys around the streetlight? Because that's the only place you're going to find them. Yeah. You know, that, that reminds me of one of Freeman's most amusing uh, contributions, which was to try to find freeze dried fish yeah. in the orbit of Europa. Uh, you know, it, it seems like an outlandish idea, but it's something that's easily detectable. So why not start with that? Yes, exactly. And the thing is, it's actually, it actually looks that, that idea actually looks more and more realistic. I mean, we're, quite capable of getting there and finding things. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so what I want to do is, you know, talk about something that it, in, in some sense, it's really at the core of the book and, you know, it speaks to the subtitle, which is the emergence of technology, you know, beyond programmable control. And, and you know, there's, there's many ramifications of this, but, uh, you know, maybe what I want to start with is, is this very poignant part of the book, uh, a tragic story, really, where, you know, the U.S. Army use the first modern optical communications network to, to subjugate the, the Apache Indians. And um, it, it kind of strikes me that there was already, and you know, similar examples were already examples of technology beyond the, the control of certain groups of people. Now, of course, in this case, the, you, know, you said that the, 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 the army borrowed this, this technology from the Indians themselves because they were using uh, the you know heliographic communication, uh, but you know there's there's other instances you know the the Spaniards in in Peru and and Peru and Mexico where you know clearly there was technology that was beyond the control of one particular group. So, if you wanted to sort of trace back this thread of technology beyond human control, where do you think it it begins? Well, I think it begins at the beginning, of course. The, the sort of fact check the optical network in, in the American Southwest. That, that was not the first optical network. We had you know, very sophisticated optical net, telegraph networks in France, even at, at the end of the 18th century. So, so this, this technology went way back, mm -hmm. but the American Southwest with this absolutely clear atmosphere that this, that chapter opens where the soldiers, it's middle of the day and they can see the stars because the air is so clear, you can see the stars in the middle of the day so it's perfect for they, they in fact they one of the links they later established was 180 miles by just the flash of an eight inch mirror so they had this technology but they applied it you know in a very brutal way against the, the apaches that's that's a thread through the whole the whole book that sort of how did how did we take north america from the people who were here and but there were sort of, there were two generals. It was General Miles who built the heliograph network. And then there was General Crook, who's sort of the good guy, but still he did something even, the heliograph network was sort of drove the Apaches out of that, of 60,000 square miles. So we drove them out of it because they were, they were being watched, but it didn't, uh, didn't kill them or hurt, you know, but what was more effective was General Crook introduced numbered identity tags, and that's almost a more ominous mm. th thing where they, where all Apaches had to wear a numbered metal tag around their neck, and if they didn't have a tag, they were legally hostile and, and could be killed. And, mm. and that, those two technologies, the the digital communication network and the numeric identity, they were both spelled the end of of that not Apaches in general, but that particular group who then got got imprisoned in, in Florida tragically, and that's the omen for the future. Because of course now, 
the moral of the story to me is that we're, we're all the Apaches now. We're all going to, you know, we, we all effectively wear a numbered identity tag and, and can be monitored all the time. If that, that can be totally okay, or as we know, it can be, it can be, uh, you know, totally go, end up end badly. And, and right. I, and and, and that, this was, oh no, go ahead. No, this is sort of the first explicit warning of that, this path that America was going down the wrong mm -hmm. path. And th these numbered identity tags, you know, they are imposed on us by technology itself. Uh, and and, and what, what you're saying is that, you know, quite apart from the obvious ways, ways in which, let's say, the NSA was, was tracking American citizens, but it was still a very deliberate act on the part of human beings to impose this technology on other human beings. But part of what you're saying here is that now this technology has, has taken on a life of its own and it's doing that itself without any intervention to, to, to some extent. Yes, I mean, sort of, it's, it's effectively true now that I mean, every human being has, has a numbered identity and that, that was sort of science fiction at one time and now it's, now it's true. It's sort of up to us to, to determine whether that go, ends, ends well or ends badly. But that's, mm -hmm. that's definitely the issue we're in right now. Right. Or if you don't, and if you don't have an identity, that alone is makes you suspicious, which was sort of why, why this Apache system was so effective. Because if you, if you didn't have a tag, it wasn't like you were neutral. You, that immediately put you in the bad set. Right, the right. That, the whole us, us, us versus them kind of mindset in some yeah. sense. Um, so, so at the end of the book, around the end, you know, you have this image that at least to me was startling and disturbing, which was, uh, you know, your daughter uh, texting you from the San Francisco airport and uh, describing uh, seeing, a, a, what was it, a three-month-old infant uh, glued to an iPhone? Uh, <laughs> some, some. <laughs> yeah, she was, so that was 2012. And that was 2012. Um, I, I, yeah, copy that. I, so she get, arrives in San Francisco for her first job, sort of her first, you know, uh, job. She's actually going to work for Code for America. I saw a baby playing with an iPad so young it was still drinking mother's milk. Oh, <laughs> so is, it, is that a, a view of the future? And, and do you find it disturbing or do you just find it as, as an extension of our intelligence? Uh, I find it disturbing, but like, like everything else, I always try to look at it everything's a mirror and what does it look like the other way so so you can also say well i you know i was in san francisco i saw an ipad playing with a baby i mean <laughs> you, know, you know from from the from the other side of that digital mirror there's this you know enormous wealth of digital intelligence there and, and here's a baby like what a, you know if you were if you were and i i when I talk about AI, I'm, I'm, I have no interest in commercial AI, which I think is, is sort of domesticated. It's toys. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in wild AI, you know, the, the mm -hmm. untamed ones. So, so the wild AI that's out there, you know, nothing would be more interesting to a wild AI than a, a baby. I mean, here's a baby who doesn't even have a language and it's playing with me. Like, oh, well, we, we, you know, we're not, oh, these other people, I have to speak through the keyboard with letters, but this is a baby who's not trying to speak to me in language. Yeah, and, and you know, that sort of reminds you of the idea of, you know, just like Dawkins had the selfish gene, thinking about humans as just merely vehicles for genes, you know, so now it looks like we are vehicles for self-replicating code because, you know, code is actually using us to replicate itself all the time, along with replicating itself independently of us. Exactly, yeah, and, that, and so that ties into what Samuel Butler, who, who sat in this uh, sheep herders hut in New Zealand at the time of Origin of Species and wrote this this prophetic vision, Darwin among the machines, and, which I I sat here. I mean, I'm in this beer cooler in this old tavern on the Bellingham where, where, where I wrote Darwin among the machines with no internet. I sat in here reading library books and wrote that book. And there's a thing that Butler said that I completely missed. I mean. At, he, he said that the, we talk about whether machines would really destroy people or not. He said, no, why may not man himself become a sort of parasite upon the machines, hmm. an affectionate machine tickling aphid. <laughs> and, and, you know, 25 years ago, I missed that. But now, of course, 
that's what that's what it is. We, that's, that's spot on. Machine tickling aphids, just tickling these machines. <laughs> yeah, tickling that baby in the San Francisco airport, clearly. Yeah. Um, of course, and you know, in, in Darwin among the machines, uh, uh, you can remind me, but don't the, isn't there a collective decision to sort of smash the machines or not develop them further? But that's something that seems impossible now. Right, so the, the whole point of but Butler's book was it, well, this is going to happen. Machines are gonna take over the world, but we can't stop it. This is sort of very much like Voice of the Dolphins. He's like, I'm gonna tell this story, but I'll tell it as science fiction. So he wrote the story, this is Valley, that's actually the valley in New Zealand where he had built his homestead. They agree to stop all technology beyond the laundry ringer. You can have you can have everything up to a laundry ringer, but not beyond. So so clocks and watches are, are uh, you know, and it doesn't end well. So it's a classic sort of dystopian. Right. It, it, it's bad when the machines take over, but it's also bad if you try and stop it. Right. And 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 you know that's that's a perfect segue to things like that people like Elon Musk and and you know Bill Gates have said about this very dystopian you know terminator like view of technology but to me it seems like what you're saying is is much more interesting because it's not about machines openly declaring war on human beings and killing them but it's more like machines getting human beings addicted to them and you know tickling them and getting tickled back and that just seems so much more benign but it it seems that in the long term it's much more insidious yes i mean it's it's a case of what our role is and again, again you know stan ulam thought about this very deeply and, and, and had this, he, he had to, to me again, had one of the best analogies. He said like in the, in the game of evolution, because we're all, we're all playing this game, I mean, which is the dystopian fear is, well, we're playing this game of evolution, the machines are gonna win. And so, so we lose, sort of the Trump kind of thing, like you either win or you lose, but you can't have both. Mm -hmm. And so, but then Ulan asked, well, what, how do you really define win what does winning mean and, you know the, the logical way to find me we say well winning would be if you get to go to infinity if you you know like winning evolution in the in the Dawkins sense is if your genes keep on perpetuating get to, so then, then you've won okay but then and so Ulan says well what about the chicken you know like a, no matter how how good humans think they're doing they're gonna they're gonna bring the chicken along with them and the chicken will also go to infinity so which is, <laughs> is it better to be the human or the chicken and that's right, that's right. that's that's the case with uh, with these machines i mean we, we will get brought along but are we you know are we just coming along as the chicken and, yeah and and you know that leads me to the to the future of space exploration because clearly it's something that we want to do uh you know Companies like SpaceX are building these reusable rockets, and and I know you you were involved with Jeff Bezos's venture at, at the beginning, and um, you know it, it seems that you know that's that's another way in which you know machines in the form of von Neumann probes, for instance, would find a way to just use us as as vehicles to spread you know beyond the galaxy, essentially. Yes, I, of course, I firmly believe that's what's going to happen. I mean, it, it, you know, we are going, we as life are going to go into space, but, but, you know, probably not we as human beings very far. Mm -hmm. That's, but that's, you know, that's the far future. So is, is there anything we can proactively do or should we just enjoy the ride? You no, know, I think there's very definite things we, we should do, which is to sort of remember and respect the individuals. I mean, that's, that's what my whole argument is. It's, it's everything depends on, we tend to think of sort of big general technologies and I, I much more like to think of individual people. Remember the people who pioneered these things and why they pioneered them. And of course, I'm on the side of the Apaches. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how can you do this kind of thing without, uh, without wiping out the Apaches? You don't, you don't need to. I mean, that, that's the, the, the tragedy is that we have always tended to wipe out certain groups of people in our, in our progress and that just because that's the way it's always been doesn't need to be that's the way it the way it has to be and how can we move forward and and avoid uh repeating that and you know it, it, interestingly enough in space we sort of have an opportunity what interested me so much about the russians in alaska was that they reversed that the normal colonial model is you 
the colonizers come in and replace the indigenous technology. The Russians came to Alaska and they adopted the indigenous technology. And, and it was a very different world resulted. And it's the same in space. We have the chance to be colonizers, but without, uh, you know, without exploiting the indigenous population. There is no indigenous population. So the danger is that while well, we bring robots and robots become the indigenous slaves who we then just go through the same cycle of exploiting the, right. the robots. But how can we do it in a much more uh, harmonious way? I mean, obviously there's gonna be more robots than, than people. Mm -hmm. But how, how can that be done much more fairly than in the past? And, and in some sense, what you're saying is part of the history of life on this planet. And, you know, because it, it reminds me of symbiosis. Yes. And, and for a long time, of course, Lynn Margulis, you know, came up with the idea of symbiosis and mitochondria. It was thought to be an anomaly, but now people are realizing more and more that it was really not the exception, but the rule uh, during the evolution of life. And that's what made advanced multicellular complex life possible. Yes, Lynn is one of the, I mean, truly unrecognized, or now she's not unrecognized, but she's for so long, her, her, the importance of her ideas were unrecognized. Right. And, and, and the same goes for, you know, Barbara McClintock, who talked about jumping genes. They were thought to be an anomaly, anomaly too, but, you know, the, 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 the analogy I see with jumping genes is, you know, ideas basically jumping around and cross fertilizing each other fairly randomly. And, you know, that's how, how most great ideas come along really. Yes, or Dorothy Jean Ray, if you ever want to really go down a tragic sort of little path, go to the Institute and, and look at the file for Dorothy Jean Ray, who, okay. who, who wanted to decipher the genetic, uh, you know, the structure of DNA and she had a very clear path for doing it. She wanted to work at the Institute because Princeton didn't accept women and her position was vetoed tragically. But, you know, she didn't, she had a model that was a sheet, not, not the double helix, but I'm convinced if she had actually been allowed to do her work, she would have got there and, and uh, she had good good references and ended up being a high school teacher instead of right. you know, so, so this was, Dorothy Rinch was the woman who had this big fight with Linus Pauling. I right. Okay. I had the name wrong. Yeah. Rinch. Right. Yeah. right. And then of course, you know, Pauling was a very dominating personality, a huge figure. And, and that's why her ideas got ignored. You know, now I remember who, who you're talking about. Yeah. So she wanted to come to the Institute would have been perfect for her because oh, they, yeah, they, 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 it was a place where a woman could, do research and, right, and, right. and oh the internal file of how her how you know mm -hmm. the arguments about why we can't let her do this work oh it's just it's just just crippling that is fascinating I, I had no idea she wanted to come there and and speaking of the institute of course you know you have great recollections in your book about your father freeman but also other very interesting people i was really struck by this image that you seem to remember of, of von neumann stopping by your crib and offering you a drink when you were a few years old, <laughs> which which would be, you know, totally consistent with what we know about his flamboyant personality. Um, but it looks like, you know, there's 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 more and more a need for institutes like the IS, especially in this world full of distractions. But I also think that, um, in, in some sense, you know, the IS is an ivory tower, and even Freeman sort of deplored that to some extent. That's why he wrote so much about inventors. And, you know, and in, in, in your book, you write, uh, you make a very interesting point about our educational system, which is that it really seems to draw a distinction between people who do things with their minds and people who do things with their hands. And that's, that's a, a pretty bad distinction. We really need to erase that distinction. So do you see a sort of hybrid model uh, of, of the IAS, you know, where these two very different, seemingly different capabilities can can be merged. Yes. Well, don't you know? Be careful what you ask me, because I had a very clear solution to the problem at the institute because I grew up there. But the, it was an old farm. It was a former farm, and then it was turned into this paradise for scholars. And it hasn't really worked out as well as was hoped. I mean, what the fundamental problem now is that you, you can no longer be isolated. The idea was you would go there for a year. And, and you couldn't be on any committees or advise any students so you could just do your great work. But the problem now is you, you come to the Institute, you're, 
you know, you're still expected to advise people and be, because of the internet and email, you can still be connected to all that bureaucracy or otherwise it would escape from. But, but the fundamental problem, I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there that the, that, so anyway, my solution for this would have been, it, it, they should have kept it working as a farm. So it's this, it's this paradise, but the deal is, you know, one or two hours a day, you still have to work on the farm. And that would have got the, you know, even von Neumann would have had to work on the farm somewhere. And, and, and uh, it, it would have kept all, because they, the problem was it differentiated. The idea was that the historians would talk to the mathematicians and so on, but they didn't. They completely separated into their little isolated groups, except for a few exceptions. And, mm -hmm. and if it had been part of the deal, you had to keep working on the farm, then, then you would have had to go, you know, work in the fields with, with the historians. Yeah, I think that's a great model. It, it, it obviously seems much more similar to Butler's Mesopotamia, where, you know, he, he builds this homestead and then engages in very deep thought. Or, you know, for that matter, your life, you know, on top of the Douglas fir, where, you know, you, you were isolated in some sense, but still writing Darwin Among the Machines. Or, well, well you're reading Darwin, Darwin Among the Machines, but that gave you the idea for writing the books. Yeah, and all the people, I mean, like, uh, you know, Oswald Veblen would go out in the woods a lot and, and uh, Oppenheimer would go sailing in the Virgin Islands mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, one of the mathematicians I was, a lot of the mathematicians were climbers and went climbing and stuff, but they all, they all, they all went elsewhere to, to do these things. Right. Flex, Flexner had a place in Canada, but no, they, they should have been doing something together, I think. But, but right. again, I'm, I'm not a, institution leader but it really it really is a fundamental problem with these institutions how do you keep the group uh, mm -hmm. working together that's right okay so we have about five minutes left i don't want to eat eat too much into your sunday but um uh, the limits to knowledge uh you know uh, you you talk in in this book uh, but especially in previous ones about yodel and his incompleteness theorems and you know how he found out that there are these fundamental limits to pure mathematics and and knowledge and um, in, in some sense, you know, I, I remember Freeman always used to say, this is great, because that means that, you know, the, the world of ideas is going to be inexhaustible and we'll, we'll never find a, find a theory of everything, basically. Do you see something similar happening with computing? Because partly because I know there have been some attempts recently to uh, essentially prove or disprove how much machine learning can uncover uh, based on the continuum hypothesis. Uh, which you write about, but uh, I, I just wonder if you have explored those kinds of thoughts. Yes, I think about that a lot. I think it's very much a glass full or glass or half half full or half empty view. I mean, some people think, oh, this is, you know, Gödel proved that that computers have limits. And I, no, I think he proved exactly the opposite. That even in a, in a strictly logical, perfectly closed system, you can always discover truths that are outside the system. That that's why Freeman was was happy about it and most people you should be happy about it but it, it proves and and Turing was very I mean the most of his later life was spent in that regime of I mean how do you how can you build machines that transcend themselves so it's effectively not artificial intelligence is easy it's artificial intuition that's the hard thing so he, he was already beyond AI into artificial intuition and that's that's the important thing and and Gödel's results were very profound, and he usually misunderstood. And he was also deeply religious, which is forgotten. That that Gödel was had a great deal of faith, and 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 understood this in a very logical way. That 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 logic couldn't encompass everything. And and so I'm on obviously on the Freeman side. My mother was also you know who worked much more deeply in the, the Gödel sort of vein, but. I mean, she sort of said it's it's just very simple. You can have completeness or you can have consistency, but you can't have both. Right. And so make a choice or and 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 that makes yes, it's certainly what makes life interesting. And it's what it's what proves that the sort of anti Apache system of we're going to number everything and control everything and everything is going to be programmable, that is provably false. That it's mm -hmm. all there are always going to be things that are, as you said at the beginning, are are provably unprogrammable beyond the outreach of the algorithm. And, and people need to understand that and respect it. And that's where people like, uh, you know, Elon Musk and Ray Kurzweil, I think go completely wrong. We're thinking that, mm -hmm. that, that, that 
we can have this formal system that that works. It's not it's not going to work. You by definition have to have this this sort of wildness is always going to come back. Right. And, and I mean, to me, that sounds like a very optimistic scenario, you know, and far from dystopian in some sense, because it just means that there's no limits to how much we can know uh, as long as we stop trying to control everything. Yes. Which, uh, which I think is a great message and, and a great takeaway from the book. So, yep. okay, I, I think that's a great note to end on, uh, you know, won't take too much more of your time, but thanks so much, uh, you know, for your time today. This, I truly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, so Analogia is, is the name of the book. Highly recommended. It will take you on a wild journey. So hopefully all of, all of uh, my readers can, can read it and uh, send you their feedback. Yes, and thanks to Three Quarks Daily for, for allowing us to have such a sort of unstructured conversation. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I like about that. All right. So I'll, I'll be in touch, George. And, and thanks again for your time. Enjoy, enjoy yep. the rest of your day. Thank you. Good. Okay.